Good morning, afternoon, or evening to those around the world. And welcome to our webinar today on utility planning for success in 2022. My name is Barika Poole, and I'm proud to be part of Rock Blue, an international NGO focused on empowering water and sanitation utilities to create healthy cities and improve lives. For more information, please check out our website at rockblue.org. Today's webinar is on utility planning for success. As utilities look to recover from the impacts of a global pandemic, on service delivery, staffing, and revenue, what are the ways in which they can approach strategic planning to carry out their capital improvement plans and be successful in the years to come? Our expert today will talk about successful strategic planning and making sure that the plan is realistic and the utility can meet its goals. They will talk about common mistakes that happen in strategic planning and how to overcome them and lessons learned and how to plan for excessive effective service delivery in the future. I'm going to start with Dr. Jeff Sebiura Mukasa, who is the managing partner of Imprint U LTD. Dr. Jeff Sebiura Mukasa is a capacity building expert with a strong business leadership and financial background. He trained in the UK and has worked for multinational organizations in various parts around the world. Jeff has strong facilitation skills and can draw from a vast experience within the private sector to build both individuals and organizational capacity. He has received his doctorate in business leadership from the University of South Africa. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I'm Jeff Sabiram Kasper, my name is, and I'm very excited to be with Rock Blue this afternoon in this part of the world where I'm talking from. So it's exciting to be part of this especially talking about effective strategic planning. I'm glad and I'll share briefly for us to actually be able to see the different areas that we're actually going to be talking about. We'll talk about the stages of effective planning, why it is important to have a clear vision, how this aligns and how to make sure that your strategic plan aligns or your strategic objectives align with your mission and vision. We'll talk briefly about some key performance indicators and why these come through clearly, as well as one of the challenges that most people have when they're actually executing their plans, and that is closing the execution gap. But let me start off by this picture. It's a beautiful picture. You usually ask people, what do you see? And you get all sorts of answers. What we see here before us is an air balloon. And I can guess there's some people who are tourists, maybe it's somewhere in Africa, they're looking at the giraffes, they're looking at the elephants down in the park. The sun is setting. We can also see that there's a fire that's actually keeping this balloon in place. And today, even as we discuss strategic planning, it's important that from time to time, organizations take an opportunity and look at the big picture, look ahead, and be able to plan for an organization. An air balloon takes you off the ground and up in the sky and gives you an opportunity to see things at a different dimension. And I believe that any leader needs to have that opportunity from time to time, even as you do your strategic plan, to see things from a long-term perspective. But let's look at some of the other aspects that are usually how strategic plan is normally approached. We refer to this as the traditional one. There are various approaches, but I'll use this particular one. We start off with a strategic intent that will entail your vision, your mission, and your objectives. And we'll briefly talk to these in a moment. Then of course, once you have clarity of your vision, it's important to periodically take content of where you are your SWOT analysis, use tools like your story, your sweat, your pastel, and other tools to actually be able to assess where you are and in the process formulate your strategy. But it's not just important to formulate your strategy, we need to implement it. And how do you do that? How do you allocate resources? How do you make sure you have the right people to actually be able to implement that strategy? And then eventually it's important to take stock and evaluate and see how are we doing vis-a-vis -vis the plan that we put into place. So we'll try and look at each one of these individually and just see what it actually means, even as we talk about a plan. 
I think when planning, it's important to start with the end in mind. End in mind means to take a moment and say, so where do I see myself? Where do we see ourselves as an organization, as a utility organization? Five years from now, where do we see ourselves? I know after a pandemic like COVID, one might wonder, is it important to plan three or five years ahead when anything can actually happen? Given that could be a challenge, but I think it's important to at least to take a moment and see and have the end in mind. Your vision, your vision is where you as leaders clearly articulate that this is what we want to actually see. Your mission, what are you going to do to actually be able to ensure that you can achieve that vision? And then of course your values with the underlying platform that actually hold you up together. So it's important that you have an end in mind that clearly strategizes and enables you to see the future. I like the chessboard. When you're playing chess, you have these pieces before you. And it's important that before you move a piece, that you have a clarity of where you want to go. And I believe that your vision is one of those things that gives you um, the direction or the inspiration to actually be able to pursue and move the right piece at the right time. But whilst having a vision is important and it's looking ahead, I think one needs to take stock of what is happening now. As an entity, what are your strengths? We've seen today, especially in the challenges that we've had with the recent pandemic, that many of us found out that items that we thought were our strengths were no longer working for us. What are your weaknesses? What opportunities do you have? What threats face you? And usually the SWOT is very much from an internal perspective as an organization it takes a moment to reflect internally and see its internal strengths, its internal weaknesses, and maybe the opportunities or threats from an external perspective, but have an impact on them as an organization. And as you assess this, it gives you an opportunity to be able to know as I plan, as I put my strategic plan in place, how do I address this? How do I leverage my, my strengths as well as the opportunities I have? And how do I mitigate my weaknesses or the threats that I face? But another tool that we usually use when we're actually planning is a pastel, looking at what's the political, economic, social, technological, environment, and legal. And as one looks at all these different aspects, it becomes an important element. As a water utility, I know especially as we talk about sustainable development goals, we see that it's important that we look after the environment. So you're going to find that for many organizations that becomes a key item. How am I managing the political factors that are actually affecting us? From an economic perspective, are there issues that I need to talk, for instance, with decisions that have been made and they have a bearing on us from a tax perspective or other aspects, social. We see that um, today in many communities, for instance, from the lockdown perspective, there were social factors that actually did affect many organization technology. Today we're having this webinar and we're leveraging technology to actually be able to meet across the globe. The environment has already indicated that of course the legal implications as well become factors that one needs to do. So both the sweat, SWOT and pastel enable us to assess the situation and make sure that even as we plan, we have clarity of where we are as an organization. Moving on, once we are clear of that, we know where we're going, which is our vision. We've assessed our situation and we now look at the strategy formulation. And as you set your strategic objectives, I think we need to ensure that they are aligned to our vision and mission. As we work with many organizations, there's sometimes a temptation to have too many strategic objectives. And while it's not cast in stone that they have to be 20 or five or three or two, I think common practice, at least what we've seen work, three to five, of course, within each strategic objective, you might have sub-objectives, is a number that at least is manageable as you actually work through this to ensure that you can actually be able to do that. Of course, as you set your objectives, they need to be timed. They need to know, we usually use a log frame that enables us to actually be able to know what, when is it going to be executed? How are we going to measure? How do we implement it? What do we actually require? And that becomes an important aspect to try and see how we ensure that we actually do this. 
Now, on strategic objectives especially, the temptation at times and the struggle is how one moves away. And I'll use a look from in one of my slides to try and see how one moves away from just making your activities, your strategic objectives, but to try and make sure that you actually can focus on where we go. And I think this brings me to this particular slide. As we set our strategic objectives, it's important that we align for what impact do we want to achieve. You remember we talked about having a vision. So that impact becomes, it's a long term and higher level effect. What change do you want to have, even as you set this? And as we do this, this then enables us to work backwards. I know that the temptation at times is to start with the input and activities, but starting with the impact in mind enables us to work backwards. So with that in mind, then what outcome are you going to work with? What output are you going to have? That what activities and what input? I usually enjoy this and uh, my wife is a physician and for from time to time she's tried to work on having a healthier lifestyle. And would we'll say that the healthier lifestyle would be the impact that she wants to achieve. But to be able to achieve that healthier lifestyle, she had to actually work backwards and go through a few items. If I may talk about the input, she'll watch how much she eats. She'll watch how much exercise she actually does. And the activities will be, I usually see her in the evening walking around, which are the activities that are enabling her ultimately achieve ultimate goal, which is a healthier lifestyle. What are the outputs? Of course, usually after that, she'll periodically, maybe on Mondays, stand on the weighing scale to actually find out and say, have my activities delivered on the desired output? Weight is one of those indicators for her that actually indicates whether she's having a healthier lifestyle. And of course, if we move that to the outcome, she's done, watch what she's eat, she's done her exercise, she's measured her weight to see whether that is actually delivering the results. Then the outcome, the results or the efforts of that output, over a time she's actually, she loves when I give her a compliment and say, wow, you've actually, your exercises have actually made a difference. And of course the ultimate goal is for her to have and us, us as well, a healthier lifestyle. And I'm using that as an example that even as we talk about strategic planning, yes, as an organization, we need to know what impact do we want to have? As a water utility, is it managing the level of or the, the, the communities that actually have access to water? So if that's the ultimate impact, which is actually part of our uh, sustainable development goals, how are we then going to work backwards to ensure that the inputs, the activities, the outputs and outcome enable us to actually achieve that. So this becomes an important aspect, even as we talk about working through. But as we do that, I think one of the challenges that many of us usually face is then how do I work through how do I measure to know whether I'm on track? And this becomes an important element of us working through the key performance indicators. I'm an accountant by training, and as indicated in my introduction, I've had the opportunity to work for different organizations. One of the organizations that I worked with was Coca-Cola. I spent about 15 or so years within Coca-Cola. And as a finance director, key for us and key for me was to make sure that we set smart objectives. Now, smart objectives, are what most of us would know the acronym for smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Well, to ensure that you can actually be able to work with people and ensure that you can actually be able to measure this. Towards the end of my career within Coke, my role was as a divisional director based in one country, and I had several countries, so I wasn't physically there. But it was important that as you put a plan together, you could actually be able to cascade this through the different levels. So you set the smart objectives and you ensure that what you, our goals are, are aligned to what our vision and mission as earlier mentioned is. And as you do that, you, we had indicators 
that enabled us to see, are we moving towards the desired goal? One of the elements that we actually used was as a beverage industry, we're very keen to know how many liters of water were we using per liter of beverage. So that was an indicator. And if you are falling out of that, then one need to see what do you need to do to ensure that you can actually move back. So an indicator becomes something that actually enables you to see, am I moving in the right direction? Am I moving away from the target I've actually set? We know that at times the aspirational goal of number of liters used per liter of privilege were aspirational and we couldn't achieve that in one year. But if we are able to work on, we set a target that ensured that we're moving towards that. It's like a journey. You don't get there in one day. Rome wasn't built in one day, but at least if you're moving towards that, that becomes an important aspect. We had benchmarks or baselines. We're looking at other players within the industry, other players as competitors, and finding out how are they doing on that particular key performance indicator. And if they're doing better than us, what can we borrow from them to see how we can actually improve our ways to see how we achieve that? We'd also measure success and celebrate success. One of the things we used to do is to celebrate the most improved. For instance, if it was X liters, then you reduce it to Y liters, and it actually shows the efforts you've taken to do that. We'd celebrate that, we'd measure it, and we'd celebrate that. But it was also important to know who was responsible. And I think that becomes a key aspect in that if you have a key performance indicator, you need to actually be able to know who is responsible, who am I going to hold accountable? As a divisional director, as held accountable for my region, but I had to cascade it down to specific countries to make sure who are you holding accountable to achieve that? So as I said, key performance indicators, these aspects become important because this enables you to see, am I moving in the right direction? or my moving off target. But as I come to the close of my session, I've seen many beautiful strategic plans and some of them could be beautiful books, well-bounded. And you get something that is nice and polished, just like my book here. And they ask, where's your strategic plan? And somebody will actually say, this is my strategic plan. But the challenge that we've seen with many is that sometimes Strategic plans are nicely bound and just put on the shelf. Why am I utility and it's required of me to have a strategic plan? And why do we many times fail to actually be able to implement our plans? Or why do we many times get a challenge? And we call this the execution gap. How do we close the execution gap of what we've planned vis-a-vis -vis what the reality is? I think when we've assessed, there's some studies that have indicated that one of the key challenges is what we refer to as the wallowing. The wallowing comes, and whilst you might have a very good strategic plan, the wallowing like COVID-19, the wallowing like election time, the wallowing like a war in Ukraine can come and actually take you off map. And then this, usually comes in either existing work or, or accidental work. Usually the wallowing tends to come for many of us in what is urgent, seems urgent and important, that it actually takes you off track from what you've actually planned. So many of us are caught up with the urgent daily work that we don't take time to actually focus on what's in our plan. And what we encourage most organization is that even as you're putting your plan together, it's important that it actually tries to ensure that it accommodates what would be the wallowing to ensure that what you're doing has a role it's playing within your plan. One of the ways that we've found that is important to help people close, organizations close the execution gap is three or four items. One, to have lead and lag measures. I've mentioned, that Lydia, my wife, has vision, as she works on her weight, one of the things that she does is to periodically measure her weight. We call that a lag measure. At that point in time, she can't change much. But the lead is what I referred to as her doing exercises, watching what she eats. And I think for any organization, that becomes an important element, that 
let's have the lead and let's have the lag measures that ensure that we actually manage the whirlwind that's actually going to come through to us. Having a scoreboard, earlier on, we talked about key performance indicators. A scoreboard enables you to see how are we doing towards the target that we've actually set? Are we moving in the right direction? Or are we moving off focus? And ensuring that we can actually be able to challenge ourselves back to achieving the goals that we've actually set. Even as we work through our strategic plans, it's important that, of course, the people know what they're actually pursuing. We've already talked about the vision, the importance that the people who are actually doing this are clear on why and how the strategic ob objectives align to the vision that you've actually indicated. These become important aspects that we need to put into consideration. And finally, even as we talk about that, of course, the people who are actually involved, that engagement becomes a key item. So as I end, let me just go back to this, that as we plan, it's important that we are planning with for impact. You're not just putting a, we're planning for impact. And right from the resources that we put in the input, the activities that we run, the activities to ensure that we can actually be able to deliver, the output from those activities, which will be the products or services that the people are interfacing with, the results that we periodically measure by the different stakeholders that we're actually working for, ours, if we're going to have an effective plan, is to ensure that all these are having an impact, are creating the long-term and the short-term goals that we're actually working for. So with that, I would want to thank you and I'll be open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jeff. That was a very enlightening process on strategic planning and definitely um, what we need to avoid and what we definitely make, need to make sure that we have. Next, I'm going to move on to our next presenter. Our next presenter is Gisela Kaiser. She is a registered professional civil engineer with nearly 30 years of experience in the development and management of diverse infrastructure projects and programs in South Africa. She is the vice president of Water Globe Consultants, and she's responsible for sustainable water management, taking a deep dive into desalination technology while advocating the compelling case of holistic sustainable water management, especially in water stressed lower income countries and other metropolitan municipalities in South Africa. Thank you, Verika, uh, for the fun introduction. It's a pleasure to, to be here and to engage on such an interesting topic. Um, it was very interesting to see Jeff's um, presentation first, and he probably won't approve with my approach uh, with how I'm going to present. Because as I, while I agree that fewer strategic objectives are certainly better, the wicked problems that are faced by utilities in the water and sanitation field requires integration of such a myriad of aspects. Um, Unfortunately, engineers prioritize the physical outcomes, no matter how difficult they are to, are to implement, but it tends not to be as neat a case study as one can present from an academic viewpoint. So my presentation is a little bit more tactical um, than Jeff's was. Um, I often found at conferences and such, I felt a little bit out of the loop because I had all my experience with where the rubber hit the road rather than from an, uh, a theoretical perspective but I think that it's very important to also understand and to be able to bind the two together the academic side and making sure that the process is there but also that it is really worthwhile um, yeah and just casting a different light on how things are done but I thought that I would start um, as the topic is for utility planning for success in 2022 to start at the point of failure. So what does failure look like? Well, failure is pretty much when there is no service. And we're talking here about basic services and the basic services of water and sanitation, um, which is arguably the most basic service. So it can be a failure that there is no service, that there's no water or a sanitation service, or alternatively, that often it feels like services miraculously still work, 
but there's such a lack of management and a lack of back office support or political support that it's really only a matter of time until they fail. Similarly, if service infrastructure is sound, service delivery can continue for a while without much new investment before things start to fall apart. Another very important aspect, which I'll spend a little bit of time in, is that of public trust. And with public trust at an all-time low, it takes real skill to retain the necessary trust so that people will respect the infrastructure, trust a utility to provide the infrastructure and be willing to actually pay for it. So moving on to the next slide. What does failure look like? Um, in the first instance, it's a lack of service. So insufficient supply, it can be due to a failure to, re to reconcile demand and supply of a water system. Over time, this can result in shortages, which requires water restrictions, such as will happen during times of drought. It could be just irregular service supply due to frequent outages from infrastructure failures, which I think is happening all around the continent. Um, an additional step to this is intermittent supply, where a utility actually plans to only supply a service for certain periods of, of a day and make that known. In South Africa, our most vivid example is that of load shedding. When the grid is oversubscribed, then we know for certain periods of every day, we will be shed. Water shedding is less common in, in South Africa. Another failure of service is in poor water quality so that even if there is sufficient water in the system it's not safe to drink and in an area where people are reliant on potable water from taps we're not only reliant but are used to it it requires a step change to then accommodate tap water that isn't safe to drink that isn't of the quality that you can allow that to go into your household appliances so forth. Um, lack, of in, lack of sanitation, I mentioned just because it's that important, although I'm not going to deal much with sanitation, and this is more focused on water supply, but in terms of dignity, it is always worthy of attention and the role that sanitation plays in water demand and how we treat water is incredibly critical and we should never lose sight of that and leave that out of our planning. Then lack of infrastructure, whether it is due to infrastructure growth and not managing to keeping up with uh, growth within a city or else if infrastructure is just broken due to lack of maintenance, whether it's old and dysfunctional and there's just not enough investment in it. It is very difficult when you build new infrastructure, it's not going to require maintenance in the first few years. And then suddenly that maintenance burden hits you. And you generally only realize it too late. And despite us being decades into knowing how to build, procure, do amazing infrastructure projects, we still haven't quite managed to seemingly, well, in, in my experience in my country, have figured out exactly how to hit the sweet spot to be able to build the infrastructure and ensure that when um, maintenance is necessary that we will actually have saved sufficiently to be able to provide the maintenance to, to, to extend the infrastructure's lifespan for as long as it possibly can be. And then I'm not sure of what's happening elsewhere in Africa, but vandalism and sabotage is an enormous problem in our country at the moment. I'm in South Africa, I, I'm, I'm in Cape Town, but I've also spent significant time in Nelson Mandela Bay. I lived in the city of Johannesburg for a number of years as well. And working with the National Department of Water and Sanitation, infrastructure vandalism is costing this country an inordinate amount of money. And um, I will talk about building, building trust later in how to solve it. But these are really, to my mind, the ways that a lack of service presents itself in one of these guises. So moving on to inefficient service. Um, the efficiency, even if you have so much water, more water than you can use, if you've got high losses and high non-revenue water, a lot of that water is going to waste. And water is valuable, water is expensive, 
treatment processes, um, distribution of water, none of this comes, comes for free. In South Africa uh, municipalities, the average non-revenue water percentage stands at approximately 41%. Uh, that is a, it comes at a cost of approximately 10 billion rand a year, which is just enormous. Um, other inefficiencies in, in water services are institutional weaknesses. We are a relatively young democracy and we are still evolving in, in how to properly function in, in the legislative environment that has been um, determined. So just in recent experience, there's, there's clearly a lack of decision-making there are very poor decisions that are made, and often when decisions are made, they are overturned. So it's um, institutional weakness means that it's very difficult to make good choices, even if from a technical viewpoint, you have all the ammunition, it is difficult to get the right decisions made to be able to ensure a sustainable water service. From a regulation point of view, this may not be common across Africa, but our corruption has led to our legislation being incredibly restrictive. And while the legislation is world-class, it hampers implementation. It is incredibly difficult to procure and to procure value for money services, um, which just leads to an efficient service because everything that you procure is going to cost you more than what anybody in the private sector will pay for it. Um, high demand, is there's a high personal individual water demand. Failing infrastructure leads to high loss and interruptions of supply. And then inefficient services. If you can't procure the necessary skills to do what you know needs doing, it delays things. It makes things more expensive. It means that your solutions are not as effective as they can be. And then in a number of instances, there's services that are un um, unaffordable. Previously interacting with Rock Blue on this, I think that South Africa is possibly one of the countries that provides the most services for free. We provide free, free housing for first time um, homeowners. Um, that services are free up to a certain level because we are aware that our society is so un unequal. So with unaffordability of um, services, the first one is the ability to pay. Now, um, inequality in South Africa is worse than anywhere else in the world. And in most cities, not much more than 50% of people pay for services, which means that there's a subsidization process um, involved. But this is very much impacted on with the willingness to pay. For those people who can afford to pay, need to be able to trust a utility that they are actually willing to pay. Otherwise, they refuse to pay and they try to cheat the system, whether it is through bypassing meters or whatever mechanism um, it happens. Then unaffordable services are also often caused by tariffs that are not, not cost, cost reflective. And many utilities just don't know, they don't have the data to know how much the services cost. The structural issues need to be need to be corrected. Often, a service charge is more a political decision than a technical decision, and this leads to unaffordable services. Because if your tariffs are too low, you actually can't afford to provide the infrastructure to provide a service. And then, of course, I mentioned that there's a corruption issue in South Africa. Public trust. I'll speak a little bit more about later. And of course, business confidence and the impact on economic growth. Who is going to invest in a city when they cannot be reliant on whether they go off grid and have their own water, water supply and uh, treat their own sewage? But a city has a competitive advantage if it has sufficient, potable quality, reliable water supply and a good solid sound sewage system as well. So, once we recognize the point of flat failure, how can we get back on track? My first point is to build water resilience, to be robust against stresses and shocks. We need to establish a talent capacity 
um, within a city or a utility. While we live in an electronic era, digitization can certainly help, but we need actual people who care enough to operate this, to plan this, to make sure that there's sufficient care in the system to provide an equitable and sound water um, value chain. The corporate environment has certainly transformed in my lifetime and change is necessary to ensure relevance, compliance and sustainability. And for this, I believe we often need institutional reform and a financial reboot of our utility services. And then to rebuild trust is crucial to all above. We require political commitment and leadership to run an, effect, an, an effective water service. So why do we talk about resilience? We want to be robust. We don't want to, if there's one year of bad rainfall, suddenly um, there is no water in anybody's tap. So looking at resilience, it, it is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems in a city to survive, adapt, and thrive, no matter what kind of chronic stresses and acute shock they experience. By chronic stresses, I mean drugs, war, and hunger, those are the chronic stresses, while acute shocks are referring to fires, pandemics, floods, and droughts. So in the Cape Town drought, I was often struck that it, it didn't feel like an acute shock, but it was a very slow moving shock that happened over a couple of years. And with this, um, water resilience can be defined as the ability to ensure that water supply is more robust to withstand the inevitable future stock, shocks and stresses, while demand is reduced to an appropriate level to serve human needs without exploiting the water system. Um, so the two cities that I'm basically talking about, about most in, um, in these slides is the city of Cape Town that has always been reliant on um, surface water systems. And the top graph shows their, their annual inflow into the dams. And as you can see, it goes up and down a great deal. But as you can see as well to the end of the graph, the last three years shown was the, was the really extreme drought between 2015 and 2017, where the, where the annual inflow into the dam system was just far lower than ever experienced before. Currently in Nelson Mandela Bay, we have the same situation. There, the fluctuation in annual rainfall is far greater than it is in Cape, Cape Town. I'm sorry, not annual rainfall, but the inflow into the system down. But it is, it is just so extreme. And when you are at such a low point, you just don't know what the next year will, will offer. So you absolutely just don't know whether you are in a situation of perpetual dry, drought, whether there has been a step change or what the next year will will offer. So largely based on my experience in the city of Cape Town, I want to talk a little bit about how you can plan to provide these um, aspects that will make sure that you have a secure water, water future, not only from a supply and demand viewpoint, but also from an organizational and a management viewpoint. But perhaps as an engineer, um, it's kind of a comfort zone. It's probably the easiest thing to address to make sure that there's sufficient water that's coming into a system. And then secondly, that you are using the water to best effect before you dabble in aspects such as corporate governance and finance and so on. So excuse me if I spend a little bit too much too much time on that. I am trying to keep a, to keep track of my time as well so that I do over time and very casually call me out. So um to build resilience, we must plan for sufficient, reliable, and safe water supply. There are, depending on where you are, there are usually opportunities to diversify supply. So historically, many, many centers relied on surface water, which is typically cheaper than other water sources, but it certainly is the least resilient to drought. For a couple of years of poor, poor rainfall, your reservoirs just run, run empty. Groundwater, in my experience, especially in Cape Town, is far more costly depending on, on accessibility and the quality of the, of, the, of the groundwater because it ranges in terms of how much treatment you, you need to apply. 
Groundwater generally lags your surface water in the impact of drought, but it must also be protected from over abstraction. There are so many things that we don't know. And one of the things in Cape Town that we were really concerned about was the number of people who sunk their own private, private boreholes and what impact that would have on the city's water table as a whole and on things like trees and parks and everything else. So we took a very much a precautionary approach, especially in the pristine nature reserves where we exploited our groundwater project. So while it, on my list, it would always be the, the second water source to be exploited if at all possible, it has to be done so with great caution. The next on our list is desalinated water. And I tend to switch these around because my sense is that that is the most expensive source of new water, but it's also the only one that is truly um, climate resilient because the sea arguably has such a large volume of water in that even with the 8 billion people on the planet, um, if we can get our demand to the right level, we can desalinate water and deal with it in, in an environmental way that, that is not going to negatively impact on the oceans as a whole. But it is a lot more expensive and requires long implementation periods. And for this reason, if you are now going to use all these other um, sources of water, it doesn't make sense not to reuse the water. We um, really need to recycle water because it's costing us more and it just makes sense to. Um, I not long ago spoke to the director of water at NIOM, um, the new city that they're building in Saudi Arabia. And he made an interesting point that why would we worry about right-sizing people, individual people's water footprint, if we are going to manage to endlessly be able to recycle water? Shouldn't we just say you can use as much water as you want to and have as long showers as you want to? as long as we can cost effectively recycle this water. That certainly is not at our fingertips yet at the southern tip of Africa, but maybe in beyond my lifetime, it's going to be a, a reality. Then what is so useful about having a diverse, um, diverse sources of water is that it really provides a buffer against low, low rainfall, and we just don't know what climate change will hold. We don't know. And that was the interesting thing in Cape Town and what we actually now experience in Nelson Mandela Bay as well, that while it is terribly unlikely that there will be a winter in Cape Town where it doesn't rain, the rainfall for a couple of years was so low, it couldn't eradicate that fear that what if. Um, in Nelson Mandela Bay, it's a different situation. Rainfall is more equal across the year. So it's not a peak winter or summer rainfall rainfall area just what we experience at the moment is that all months have low rainfall which doesn't help but it makes it a little bit more difficult because you don't quite know when to panic so alternative water supply sources provides this buff this this buffer against the absolute unknowns and managing the risk of climate change Another thing that struck me very much as I spoke about the Cape Town drought around the world is that many countries do not have accurate data about their water system. They don't know how much water is flowing into dams or how much water they, they extra extracting from, from the earth or how much water they actually use. So this is, it is such a basic point, but without having the data of, of, of how you use water and how much water you use, you can't actually start to plan this at all. And then of course, we need to make sure that we right size our demand before we invest in expensive alternative sources. Moving on to the next slide. So this um, graphic shows the amount of water available. The blue area was the system yield. The white was the a theoretical yield, but due to invasion of alien um, vegetation, that yield reduced from the white shaded area to the blue shaded area. Then the red was the um, previous demand curve. The pale blue line shows how the demand decreased within the drought, and then how it was anticipated to, to bounce back. 
while the dark blue showed the additional water schemes to augment the water supply volume within the city of Cape Town. And the important um, considerations are things like cost. Clearly, you want to implement low cost interventions first. If you can raise a dam wall and double your uh, storage volumes, then it's a no brainer, do that. But you want to not shock the financial system by implementing the highest cost initiatives first. Um, schemes where funding had already been committed should be completed unless there are compelling reasons not to do so. And that of course, sometimes political decisions are made. In my experience, desalination is seen as a very sexy solution because it's it's robust, it doesn't matter whether it rains or not, but it's also incredibly expensive. And not only is it expensive, you need serious experts to get it right. So many people have built a desalination plant that has cost a fortune, but has never yielded the right volume of water at the right quality. And then also what typically happens, uh, it happened in Cape Town, even though it was just a small scale one in May of, 2018, when we went to open our first temporary diesel plant that provided 7 million liters of water a day, that day it poured with rain. We were all in raincoats and kind of dodging the rainfall. So you have to realize that if you build a diesel plant, chances are it's going to rain and then you can decide, am I going to operate it at X plus Y or am I going to mothball it and just pay X and then have the risk of when I need the water that something goes wrong and it's going to cost me x plus y plus z so it's not a it's not yet a simple thing i trust in time the technology will evolve and and become a lot simpler um you also want to make sure that things are adaptable and scalable so you want to have projects where you can either accelerate or slow them down or build a desalination plant where you know you can double or triple it in size should climate change impact or economic growth necessitate it. You also don't want to run into the situation that um, we ran into in Cape Town where you restrict people to using 50 liters of water a day and scare investors off potentially because there's a fear that there won't be enough water. So you want to plan in advance and make sure that your alternative water schemes are there at least, well, we planned on five years before they were needed um, in, in, in Cape Town. And then finally, um, a build program should be structured in two phases so that you have some committed projects as well as an adaptable program that can be brought, brought forward or, or scaled as necessary. Then as I've now said, I think I am starting to run a little bit out of time. Now I've still got a little bit, a bit of bit of time left, um, but I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Um, I, I think it's necessary to stress though that in knowing how much water supply and demand your region uh, has and supply and demand, you need to account for changes as you go along because economic growth sometimes slows slows down, and then you need to change your model to reflect that. If climate change or um, alien vegetation has a, has a larger impact on your supply, if rainfall patterns change and your long-term averages reduce, you need to account for that and change your models. Um, to learn by doing, in crisis, we don't have time to pontificate for years. We, we often need to do things as we go along um, and just not, get stuck in three-year procurement processes. We have to engage, work, work harder, make sure that everything is going well to be able to implement projects um, rather than just pretend that it isn't a crisis. We have to increase our adaptability. Um, for example, undertaking project prep in advance and make sure that it is recorded so that if things should change and you need to muscle your, your design plan, that the next administration, whether it's the political leadership or the consultants and the contractor that you, that you manage to procure, you need to have sufficient information and documentation there for them to be able to, to work on. 
Um, I would always advise that if you're a coastal city, desalination needs to be a part of your supply mix. But pulling that trigger is such an expensive trigger. And I don't think there are many cities in Africa that could fully afford it at the moment as um, until it's a last resort. Um, industrial, uh, industrial users and um, economic users may be able to afford it. But for a household, it will probably for a long time be a lot cheaper to buy potable water in bottles and use non potable water for the rest of a household household supply. That's just a, per, um, a personal view. And then of course, we always need to mitigate social environmental risks and never underestimate the impact of procurement and implementation risks. I'm going to talk a little bit around about that further in, in building trust. Um, very importantly though, before we build additional water sources, we have to make sure that our demand is at the right level. New supply sources will always be more expensive. Um, most of our water supply and distribution networks are quite old and no one ever wants to spend on maintenance. I mentioned that it's not a sexy thing to want to budget for and it's difficult to keep in the budget and to budget appropriately. But, but to improve your network management, you need to consistently invest in it. Make sure that you um, write, um, replace all of your infrastructure at the right time. Make sure that your meters are not too old, that they are still reading, reading accurately. We found that pressure management was in Cape Town such a useful thing. We managed to save up to 70 million liters a day through pressure management around the city by stopping water loss. Uh, I'm not sure where that figure is now due to the fact that the drought is basically over. We've had dams filling now for a couple of years, but it is, such, it is such an effective way of making sure that your infrastructure is, is protected and you reduce your water losses. Um, reducing non Revenue water, certainly 41% is way too high. We need to aim for something like 25%, 20% with our actual physical losses down to 15 or 10%. But it takes so much effort and it takes efforts without curveball, such as COVID and drought and so on. It takes a lot of effort, even when everything is absolutely uh, working at 100%. Um, let me move on to the next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about establishing talent, talent and capacity. Um, I'm not sure how things are going in the rest of Africa, but recruiting people into the public service has become a lot more, a lot more difficult. Also, for a long time, people didn't particularly want to study engineering um, for economic reasons, largely. And while our unemployment figures are absolute sky, absolutely sky high, it is difficult to be able to recruit the right person for the right job. So we need to make sure that our utility has the right structure so that some, some units and people are not completely overburdened. And then we need to recruit the right talent, have mechanisms to retain them and continuously train them. It's not an easy thing to do. But the importance of leadership, and Jeff mentioned this as well, it's not only to um, be there and manage people. I think you mentioned finding a light, sharing the light and inspiring people. That is so, so critical. But it's challenging. It is not easy to do. And typically, a utility needs to do this while managing all the other things and the, and the rest of the crisis. And then clearly, consultants and and contractors are very useful. I have absolutely no information and maybe I need to go and work elsewhere in Africa for a little bit because I just don't know how the procurement systems work elsewhere. But I know that procurement in, in South Africa is very challenging and it's challenging due to the volume or the, the quantum of corruption that we've experienced. So our legislation is very restrictive in trying to uh, Stop corruption, but instead, what it does, it makes it incredibly difficult to 
procure for value for money or to procure to implement instead of creating an enabling environment where corruption is stopped and value for money is maximized it actually stops all of the good things and i don't have an answer but that one i am hopeful that in my lifetime there will still be an answer for that Moving on very quickly to institutional reform and a financial reboot. What I've experienced is that many, many utilities are not 100% sure of what their cost of supply is. So in some instances, it is because they're part of a larger organization and pay for services such as HR finance and corporate services. And thus, they don't have the ability to charge a cost-reflective tariff. Now, a cost-reflective tariff, to my mind, is sacrosanct in managing a utility if you if your utility if your utility is ring fenced you are able to sell your service to make sure that your income your revenue that you generate is sufficient to provide the service that people are paying for and that just in very simple terms is the easiest way way to run a, a utility um often engineers are not the best as at, at engaging, but they absolutely have to. Businesses are not going to invest unless they can rely on sustainable, um, stable services. So engaging with, with business just creates confidence and to be tr transparent and honest in your communication. Um, make your information available. Um, nobody should have to do a legal application to get information that should be in the public realm and having your information publicly available tends to keep it people, people honest as well. Of course, you need to assess the ability to, to pay. I mentioned that in South African cities are generally less than 50% of households pay. And that's not because the government is just being um, kind or being a nanny state. It is actually that in terms of household income, households simply cannot afford to pay for services for example our electricity tariffs have gone through the through the roof in the past 10 20 years um we must improve the willingness to pay a lot of people pay their service charges because they have no option but wouldn't it be nice if they actually trusted a utility for working hard and be grateful that tin water comes out of the tap and pays with a smile rather than grudgingly just paying it because otherwise they may be Cattle. We have to get our metering and billing right. That I know in a lot of European countries, meters are typically read once a year and people are billed monthly for that. Yeah, we're far closer to the bread line and we aspire to three meters every month. But in, you know, in, if, in any medium sized City, you've got hundreds of thousands of households, which means that every month you have to read the meter, you have to check the meter, get the right reading on the bill and send out the bill. It is a big process. There's, there's a lot of paperwork involved, but it is really critical for institutional reform and making sure that our finances are in good nick. And then to address corruption, um, from a co corporate governance perspective, I've heard I've heard it often said that you cannot legislate for honesty, and that I believe is absolutely true. You need to, through leadership and transformation, build utilities that understand how important it is to be honest and that it's a public service. You're not there because you want to exploit people. It is there to provide a service at the most affordable level. Um, moving on quickly, I think I've only got two more brief topics. The next one is building trust. And it became very, very evident to me in Cape Town that the public-private trust relationship is broken. And I'm sure everybody on the school would think that it is that it is obvious, but it just struck me like a, a 10 ton truck. And it's not just in South Africa, but it is evidently everywhere if you look at the news. Social media and the internet has enabled virtually everybody to access the entire collection of cumulative human knowledge. Many pe people believe that instantly by Googling a couple of facts, they have the, the capacity to become an expert in almost any field. And people generally think that water supply is simple. You know, there's a river, here's my house, the water can just come here and there is no problem. 
But for us to really meaningfully address inequality and providing better quality of life, we have no choice but to work on repairing the relationship of trust between the public and the state. And be it the state or a utility, I'm a believer that utility services is public good. So privatization and doing this for profit isn't really something that I believe in. But um, it's not easy in the face of social media for us to build trust, but we must do what we can. We need to be totally transparent to communicate proactively and to provide comprehensive data honestly. Water supply, the goal is not insulation, it's reliability. It's knowing that when I open my tap and I need water, that water will be there. Failure is only ever an interim step towards a truly reliable water point. So we shouldn't be as scared of failure as we are, and we need to, to, to use it as a learning point. We live in a world that is not equal and where political outcomes often are bizarre, but we must improve our management decisions. We have to prioritize building stronger relationships, optimize the overall economic and social benefit of water to everybody. And we have to work with other, other stakeholders in a water, a water system. There is no winner takes all, then we all lose. So we need to pay attention to all of these matters, to resilient outcomes, to make sure that our institutional arrangements work for all of us. My final point is on the transformation to a water sensitive city. And I believe that while it's aspirational, the eventual transformation should be part of every authority's, every utility's strategy. But we should make optimal usage of stormwater and urban waterways for flood control, aquifer recharge, water reuse, and recreation. We need to use the natural infrastructure that we have, and we have to work with it. I think for many years, engineers absolutely lost the plot, and they put in a bulldozer and did whatever they wanted to. And every time that there's a storm, a hurricane, we are taught that lesson, that nature is just stronger than the infrastructure that we can build. Um, I'm not going to dwell, dwell on this because I think I have gone quite significantly over my time, but you can all read about water sensitive, sensitive cities online. And I think it's an it's a inspirational aspiration to have our infrastructure work with a natural infrastructure and the outcomes that we can achieve are just so much better than what we can achieve without nature. So in closing, I just want to encourage all of us to um, reconsider that the key choice that we need to make and we have to get others to make is to value your water. To understand that in managing a water system, um, if it was easy, we would have done it. Managing a utility is not an easy, ch easy challenge. It wasn't easy before COVID. And there will always be many competing priorities that we have to contend with. A holistic approach is required, understanding that we need to address every aspect in an integrated way without losing sight of the reason why we want to do this. And we don't want to do this to make money, but we want to improve services to people, to better people's lives. As Jeff said, the whirlwind, the whirlwind will come no matter what to try to distract us from where we are heading. But if we keep in mind why we are doing this, I think we can work towards a successful outcome. Thanks, Barika. So next we have Dennis Wanza, who is the chief of party for DT Global. Dennis has held urban wash related senior leadership roles in organizations, including DT Global, RTI International, eWash, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and USAID's Sustainable Water and Sanitation for Africa and the Water and Sanitation Program Africa. Dennis is the former managing director of Lusaka Water and Sewerage Com Company in Zambia. He also previously held the post of managing director of the utility of the Water Utility Partnership for Capacity Building in Africa. Dennis has a PhD in Economic Regulation of Water and Sanitation Services in Africa and a Master's of Science in Civil Engineering and a Bachelor's in Civil Engineering. Dennis? Well, thank you so much for that uh, <laughs> great introduction. Um, but uh, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. 
Yeah, so I think it's really great to, uh, I don't know if you said it's really great, but uh, we've had uh, two excellent uh, uh, presentation from uh, uh, Dr. Mukasa and then of course uh, Giselle and so it's saying, and yet I'm so, supposed to talk about top five mistakes, uh, you know, uh, in the utility strategy planning in the uh, developing world. So what can I say, but to, uh, to say, uh, basically you should not do what uh, Dr. Mukasa and Giselle have told us to, uh, to do. And what, <laughs> I think it's that simple, isn't it? Uh, anyway, uh, let me just uh, give a few uh, a few points. Firstly, I think it's uh, uh, what everybody else is saying, and uh, I uh, start by presenting this uh, slide. Uh, it might be familiar to some of you. I stole it from Dr. William Hayro. Uh, basically, what do people expect from a water utility? Normally, I would add sanitation to this, but for now, let's uh, leave it at uh, water utility. Obviously, people are in need of water. And it's not just water, it must be reliable supply at the correct price or the right price. And then, uh, <clears throat> oops, yeah, uh, you know, fair treatment and uh, basically want it to be a sustained uh, service delivery uh, system. And so what tools do you use then to, uh, to achieve this particular uh, situation? Uh, why is it important for a water sustainability to have a, a vision? I think Dr. Mo, uh, you know, Dr. Mukasa already reminded us and told us that uh, you need a vision and uh, obviously uh, you need to have also a direction on how you get to where you, you want to get to. Uh, so I think it's just a reminder to, to all of us. So uh, then you talked about these three items, vision, mission and objectives, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, the, end, the end game, but also how to get there. And how to get there is, is what is most important, and that is what it basically defines, um, a, a, you know, a, a, uh, a strategy. Uh, so, and this must be a strategy, a vision in the first place must be shared by everyone. Uh, everybody in the company needs to know uh, where you are heading towards. And in that respect, uh, it's not like, you know, sometimes on the train, you find people are facing this way, others are facing that way and so on. But on the plane, you are all facing in one direction. I mean, I'm sure there might be some planes which have people facing other directions. But you want you want you don't want any of your staff uh, to lose sight of you know of where you are uh, where you are going. Yeah. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, failure to plan is planning to fail. So basically, re-emphasizing what. Uh, uh, the two previous speakers talked about that uh, you need to plan. Uh, definitely, that is uh, uh, that is important. And in your planning, you need to know where you are going. So that's why I've said here: without vision, there is certainly confusion. So you can see here. I know this might be, uh, you know, the the, the, the sign, uh, road sign, you know, but confused, uh, unsure where you're going to. It's unclear, perplexed, bewildered. So you're lost. So you basically uh, have a situation where everybody wants to go somewhere and then you don't know there's no, no proper thing. But then the other thing which you also need to know is that yes, you can have a vision, but a vision without implementation is basically a pipe dream, basically someday. So that someday we'll get there, but how to get there is everybody's uh, guess. But even as I make this presentation, I want to recognize the fact that uh, we first have a lot of experts who can help us in developing a strategy. There's a lot of uh, literature on how to develop a strategy. And also a lot of uh, literature, as I was uh, checking through, on the uh, uh, five mistakes in strategy making or development, others uh, say 10 mistakes, and all of them looked at it from different. But to me, the common goal is the need to have this vision and to have a, uh, a plan of getting there. So here are some of the, uh, some of the uh, five mistakes. Firstly, is the, an issue where uh, the CEO and the top management are developing a strategy. That means basically you front load, uh, you know, your, uh, your strategy. What it all means is that uh, you come up with an awesome new strategic direction for your company. 
as a COEO or maybe as a CEO with your uh, your directors. And then you even arrange a strategy offsite meeting with your team and write down this very awesome plan of action. And then unfortunately, within a few weeks, uh, that uh, fizzles out and you're back to square one. We have really hit the bottom, Rog. I said, yes, that's where we all are. But if the bottom is hard, meaning it's a rock bottom, as you are saying, you can either go continue on the same level or, uh, you know, or start going up. So the best is for us to, uh, you know, uh, is that now let us consider that the only way out is to go up, and that is the third one. The third mistake. Now, this is really not experts. I mean, Dr. Mukasa, uh, I think, was, uh, was great, and uh, I think he knows the subject very well. And it's great to have people who are experts in this. But you should not rely on them to tell you what to do. You have, you know, no one really knows your business more than you. You know all the, the intricacies, the challenges, and the issues, and so on. What you need is, uh, in terms of expertise, is somebody who can support you in things like framework, methodologies, like uh, he was telling us about this, what analysis, Pestel, and all the different tools and so on to help you to create uh, and execute a strategy. So uh, as a company and a lot of uh, directors, managing directors, you know, and the, uh, and so on, would say, oh yeah, no, we need this company. This company is great at the strategy making, yes, but don't rely on them. tell you what to do. Uh, third one is uh, basically just uh, in terms of uh, growth. Now, uh, in, uh, uh, growth, uh, let's take the city of uh, Lusaka. We want by 2023, average in terms of water sanitation reaches 100% or 95%. Then you talk about revenue, you talk about all the different uh, uh, areas on how to get there. So growing your business, that's not your strategy. But that is the result. So, but again, as I said, the mistake is usually to think that uh, your growth is actually the, uh, the strategy. So you must uh, be more specific uh, in terms of where you want to uh, to get to. The last, you know, it's basically three simple things. Uh, you know, uh, as I've stated here, this is basically an ingredient of failure uh, to communicate. Because if your colleagues, uh, your workmen cannot understand what you're talking about, then uh, uh, you know, basically it means you're failing to communicate. So all that you need to answer is, uh, where are we going? You know, where do we need to get to? Tim, I'm really sorry about the, uh, the glitch on my internet. I'm actually in Juba, South Sudan. But I give assurance to Barika that the uh, internet is very stable. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, and and we we understand the the challenges calling in from uh, presenting from South Sudan arises. So thank you very much. So now we're going to move into questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q and A, so that we can answer them here live. So. We do have one question. What have you found is the impact of political interference in the ability to sustain strategic focus during the implementation phase? So, you know, usually I, I, I tell my colleagues that uh, sometimes, and a lot of times, uh, what politicians say and do comes from lack of full information. You know, a politician will tell you, no, what are too expensive and so on. But if we sit down and explain to them the basis, how the whole thing is supposed to be done, or oh, this company is so inefficient. And at the same time, on the other hand, they're not giving you the tools to, to operate, but it's because we don't understand those issues. So what I can say is that uh, my own experience, it was actually an election year when I was, uh, you know, MD at the time. And uh, my own experience was that, like, let me do what I can I actually left, let me just give one small example, sorry. Uh, 
people, we had a big challenge of people not paying for water. And uh, in Zambia, one of the tools for improving your collection at the time was disconnecting, uh, people are not paying water. So I went ahead and said, told the guys that we are going to disconnect water. The guys on the team said, okay, sir, but please turn off your phone and don't come to the office. I told them I'm going to do the opposite. Tomorrow I'll be in the office and my phone will be on. True, a few phone calls came from the army commander, from the, yeah, from somebody from the, uh, from the defense, from the police. Oh no, we've received new recruits and so on. We need water. I said, sir, if we don't uh, get money in the next two, three weeks, we'll have no chemicals to pay for things because government policy is that we are not going to be giving you money to, uh, you know, to in terms of subsidizing. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that I think it's a matter of giving as much information as possible to our politicians to understand. We don't use words that we want to teach you, but just to help them just understand some of the challenges and issues and what, why things are not being. So I managed to work well anyway. Thank you, Dennis. Nisola? So just the political interference can be a big issue. And when um, political systems are not sufficiently evolved, I think it becomes a bigger issue still because um, newly elected people tend to feel that, that a new broom sweeps cleaner. So even if you've got a politically approved strategy, it's just the start and management requires to have a sustained effort to keep things going and a commitment to keep it going. So politics, I think for a very long time is still going to play a significant role and it requires technocrats to be able to read a political landscape and to work with the politicians and make sure that there is support. But it certainly isn't easy <laughs> from my experience. Thanks, Berika. Okay, so another source of diversified water supply can be from watershed improvement, such as clearance of invasive vegetation. City of Cape Town has been doing this in cooperation with the Nature Conservancy. How can we value these non-gray infrastructure approaches equally? So I think it's absolutely critical that we maximize the yield of existing water resources. So similar to water loss, you know, whether a pipe is a pipe is burst and it leaks either uh, raw water or treated water, it's not dissimilar if there's a tree that's absorbing all the water out of the dam so that the water cannot be used for the purposes that we have built the dam for for to do it. Um, so I think it's a very it's, it's a very important point and it certainly has to be part of our water resource resource planning. What I found though is that in terms of abundance, we pay very really little attention to the smaller gains. Um, and then when there's a crisis, we tend to focus on the silver bullets where there'll be large gains because they're just naturally more attractive if you suddenly need 100 million liters a day extra extra water, but you can only get two out of uh, clearing invasive aliens, you are more likely to put all your efforts into the 100 project than into the two projects. But I think it is important that we structure our utilities in a way that that, that it is managed and we are um, sufficiently respectful of nature to pay attention to the smaller gains as well and making sure that we, that we address that. And I think that Cape Town has been very successful in leading the charge on that. Um, elsewhere in the country, it, it doesn't seem to be going quite as rapidly as um, as it is in the Cape Town catchments, and that's large, largely due to a commitment point as well as a cost, a cost issue. So it's still not a free thing, but who's responsible and who pays is always a tricky thing. But for proper catchment management, it absolutely has to be considered. And yeah, we need to manage this. Thanks, Greg. I have one more question. What is the role of performance incentives and how to implement them? Can I respond to that? Go ahead, Can I respond please. to that? Thank you very much. Uh, and just like indicated, what's the role of performance incentives? Uh, my background has indicated I work in a corporate world. So performance incentives were quite a key aspect of what was actually required. 
In my presentation, I did talk about the fact that for many organizations, you actually have your targets and set objectives. And as a motivation to try and make sure that people achieve the objectives or the targets that you've actually set, there's usually performance incentives that um, are usually tied to those um, targets. And the key objective is usually, with all due respect, to use the carrot and stick to actually try and ensure that you encourage or enable individuals to pursue those with the intent that if they achieve them, there's something in it for them. So I think that's one of the key aspects why um, performance incentives have been introduced. But I would want to say that um, and how to implement them. Usually one needs to be careful with performance incentives in that if not well managed, they could be abused where somebody is actually pursuing them for to get what they're pursuing. And one needs to ensure that there's another person maybe that is not conflicted that is ensuring that it's managed well. Thank you. That ends today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of our presenters and participants for joining us today. I especially like to thank you for your time and attention that you have given them very generously. We are always looking for new topics and diverse panelists, which are central to our own values and critical for developing solutions to the challenges facing the WASH sector. If you enjoyed our online lectures and panel discussions and would like to help us to put more on, please consider making donation on our website, rockblue.org. Thank you and good day.